Salut tout le monde, bienvenue à cette conférence de euh, On a la chance aujourd'hui d'accueillir euh, Nicolas Pekap, qui, euh, qui est connu par euh, certains d'entre vous. Euh, Nicolas fait son doctorat ici, la direction de John Mackay, euh, qui fait euh, un doctorat sur euh, la génétique d'expression des gènes euh, chez les pays. C'est ce qu'il a travaillé sur, euh, sur la génétique des arbres, ce qu'il avait étudié par avant, euh, en foresterie, en écologie forestière, à l'Université de Helsinki, en Finlande. Et pourquoi je mentionne ça C'est parce que maintenant, il travaille sur les saumons. Donc, après, après son doctorat sur euh, la génétique des arbres, euh, il a fait un grand saut il est allé travailler sur les épinoches à euh, trois épines en Europe, euh, en tant que stagiaire postdoctoral avec Tennessee euh, Jones, où il a travaillé sur la génétique d'expression des gènes, cette fois-là chez les pinoches, euh, pour euh, Donc, il y a plusieurs personnes qui ont déjà travaillé ou qui travaillent sur, euh, sur les, les épinoches de près euh, de moi. Euh, vous serez intéressé peut-être de parler avec quelqu'un de ça. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, on va nous parler seulement des savons. Et après son stage pour cette euh, il a aussi continué de travailler sur les savons. Et il est retourné à la maison, il a aussi il a fait un deuxième stage pour cette j'ai travaillé avec euh, Greg Kramer sur la génomique euh, des salmonidiques et en particulier sur les bases euh, génétiques de la variation des histoires de vie chez les saumons antarctiques. Euh, et donc, il, euh, une des, des choses qui est impressionnante de son parcours, c'est qu'il est parti d'une formation en écologie professeur, puis maintenant il s'intéresse euh, aux bases moléculaires de, de certains traits phénotypiques et puis même des articles sur l'épissage alternatif. Euh, en cas d'évolution, donc c'est un parcours assez, assez impressionnant. Je suis content qu'il qu puisse venir euh, nous présenter aujourd'hui. Dans le cadre de sa bourse euh, Marie Curie européenne, euh, une copie qu'elle avait fait des travaux euh, ailleurs euh, qu'en Finlande, et un collaborateur à l'Université de Concordia à Montréal, où il est passé quelques semaines récemment. Il était au Québec pour une dernière semaine, donc j'ai pu euh, venir vous présenter ces travaux. Merci beaucoup d'être là. Et là on, on peut ouais, merci. Euh, merci, c'est très gentil. Vraiment bien d'être de retour après dix ans à l'extérieur. C'est vraiment le fun de voir euh, des faces familières. Euh, ouais, pour faciliter euh, la vie pour tout le monde, je vais présenter en anglais parce qu'après euh, dix ans, mon, mon français est un peu rouillé. Euh, dans le fond, euh, j'ai donné cette présentation euh, la semaine passée à Concordia. Et le monde m'a demandé est-ce que c'est moi dans la photo, c'est pas moi. Dans le fond, on, on, on travaille avec des, euh, avec des, des gens indigènes euh, en Finlande, c'est un, un Sami, euh, qui nous aide à, à échantillonner des, des saumons euh, atlantiques. Ça, c'est un des plus grands saumons qu'on a capturé, 27 kilos. Euh, puis on voit le petit tag qu'on met euh, en jaune sur les, sur les poissons. En tout cas, um, that's not what I'm uh, here to talk about. Uh, instead, I'm, ta I'm talking about puberty. <laughs> I'm so sorry for all the uh, parents of teenager kids. Um, so puberty, everyone here has gone through puberty. It's a very complex uh, um, phase in your life where there's many changes going on. Obviously, you become sexually mature your physiology changes, your behavior changes. So a very um, a complex kind of uh, spectrum of changes that, that is going on. Of course, humans are not the only one uh, undergoing puberty, but basically all um, sexually reproducing animals um, undergo puberty. And instead of thinking of it as this awkward moment in your time, uh, in your life, Uh, I would like to challenge you to think about puberty in a different sort of manner, uh, in a manner where um, an individual within a species might um, embark on alternative life history strategies. So you could think of an individual that wants to reproduce as fast as possible uh, so as to guarantee reproductive out output and fitness. And you might have other individuals that want to prolong their puberty for example, to grow bigger in size and therefore having higher fecundity, so having a bigger payoff, but there's always some risks involved. Uh, and one of the major risks of delaying puberty before you, uh, you reproduce is dying before you reproduce, right? So then you have fitness of zero. Um, and this sort of uh, trade-off in age and maturity and fecundity 
uh, is very common in the animal kingdom. Um, and it is demonstrated here by these Atlantic salmon. So you have a pair of Atlantic salmon spawning in the river Teno uh, in Northern Finland, female on the foreground. The act of love is happening right now. The big male is on the background. So they've come back uh, after multiple years at sea to their native rivers to spawn. And maybe you missed it, but here's a tiny male uh, sneaking around. So this is an Atlantic salmon, uh, about a hundred times smaller than the big male on the foreground. And it's embarked in a completely different alternative life history strategy than the big male. So it has never left its native river, uh, but instead has undergone puberty uh, in freshwater and is trying to uh, uh, do what's called the sneaker male strategy. So it's trying to sneak in a bigger breeding pair uh, and fertilize some of the some of the eggs. So you can see it scooping around uh, between the rocks, and you have a third, a little bit smaller male trying to join the party, um, but unfortunately he might be a little late. Um, so the life history of Atlantic salmon starts in rivers where they spawn, um, and you have these small, uh, typically male individuals that can then reproduce. Uh, however. Most of the individuals undergo their first life history transition and multiply and migrate out to sea, where they can spend any time between one to multiple years at sea. And that time they spend at the sea uh, corresponds to their, their size when they come back to spawn, uh, because fish have indeterminate growth. So basically, uh, salmon can embark on these two alternative life history strategies where they can mature as, as, as young and fast as possible, or they can prolong puberty and therefore the, uh, the sea migration uh, grow big and increase in fecundity by thousands of times, but risk of dying before reproduction. Um, and these sorts of trade-offs are, are, like I said, very, uh, very common in the animal and plant kingdom. Uh, just a few examples, I won't have time to go into details, but just to illustrate that it's actually, if you think of your um, uh, organism of choice, uh, it probably has some sort of life history trade-offs going on. And I'm very interested in variation in life history traits and trade-offs uh, and understanding the how and the why in the past and the present of variation in these traits. So how uh, do these traits develop? What are the mechanisms that uh, encode for variation in these traits? How have they evolved? And what is their adaptive value um, in, in the present moment? And for today, I'll be um, focusing on this uh, mechanism part. So what are the molecular mechanisms that encode for life history variation? And this is very interesting um, uh, point uh, because it allows us to uh, answer these very fundamental questions in life history theory. Uh, for example, these trade-offs between agent maturity and fecundity have typically been thought as a resource allocation problem so that you can't allocate resources uh, to one or the other. So there's a trade-off and it's completely resource-based. Well, there's the alternative, very exciting hypothesis that if these traits that are being trade-off, if they're uh, governed by the same genes, the trade-off mechanism might be completely uh, molecular, basically, so that you can't molecularly under, like, undergo one when you're undergoing the other. Um, and to understand these questions, uh, what we need to do is, is really map genotypic variation into phenotypic variation. So we want to understand the genotype to phenotype map in life history traits. Um, and in more practical terms, we want to understand how genetic variation interacts with molecular mechanisms that drive different cellular processes that then lead to variation in development physiology and fitness. And of course, all of these are interacting uh, with the environment. And ideally, we would like to understand how the environment interacts with all these different mechanisms. Um, now, Atlantic salmon is a very uh, excellent model to, to, to ask these questions because this large life history variation, uh, age of maturity variation, maps to a single locus uh, on chromosome 25 of the salmon genome. So this very large, very drastic, dramatic difference in CH at maturity is encoded by this one locus that contains a single gene called BGLL3, which is short for vestigial like three. And uh, we denote the uh, alleles of these genes 
by the by the phenotype that they confer. So L stands L allele stands for late maturity, and E uh, stands for the allele that confers early maturity. Um, turns out that VGL3 um, is not does not only encode this age at maturity variation, but a host of different puberal traits uh, that that we have discovered uh, in the late years. So. Um, it encodes for this maturation phenotype, but also uh, changes in or variation in body condition and, and physiology uh, and, a, and a host of behavioral traits. So it seems to be like a master gene controlling all these pubertal uh, um, phenotypes. Now, how does a single gene encode for so much variation in completely different traits like physiology, behavior, sexual maturation? Well, we can start uh, posing hypothesis by looking at the um, association, genetic association of VGL3 locus with age at maturity. So here on the y-axis, you see the original GWAS um, result. Uh, below here, you have the, the bet of chromosome 25 with VGL3 right there. And you can see that there are two SNPs very highly associated with age at maturity, one within VGL3 gene itself, it's a coding SNP that changes the amino acid sequence of the gene. And then there's a non-coding SNP in the uh, non-coding region adjacent to VGL3. Now, what we knew of VGL3 function before our studies was very limited. Basically, we knew that it is a transcription cofactor. It means that it interacts with transcription factors to regulate the expression of other genes. And now taking all of this together, we can come up with our two main hypotheses that the mechanism of aged maturity variation with VGL3 uh, might have, thing, have something to do with the regulation of VGL3, how, when, uh, and where is VGL3 being expressed, or it might have something to do with how VGL3 functions as a protein and regulates the expression of downstream genes. And to start uh, addressing these, uh, these hypotheses, we performed large common garden experiments uh, where we crossed uh, um, or we produced 32 families with different VGL3 genotypes, raised them in a common garden, so in, in, a, in a similar environment, so that now all the variation in age of maturity was due to their VGL3 genotype itself. What we saw was that, uh, first of all, we could reproduce the association with VGL3 genotype and age of maturity that we saw in nature. So the carriers, the early, early homozygotes had a significantly higher uh, probability of each initiating maturation within their first year. So this meant that now we could study this association in an in a, in a environment that is the same for uh, both alleles. We then looked at where and when is VGL3 being expressed by profiling VGL3 expression in nine tissues. I'm showing you expression in six. And we saw the highest expression in immature testes. And this really caught our eye because this uh, high expression in immature gonads really points or, or connects to that maturation uh, phenotype. Um, we then compared expression in the immature testes to the mature testes. The immature testes is very thin. I'm picking it up there with the, with the uh, forceps right there. And what we saw was that maturation coincided with a very dramatic drop in expression of VGL3. So this indicates that VGL3 is acting as an inhibitor of maturation. So when it's being expressed, it acts like a break uh, and the fish stay immature. When the, when the uh, expression goes down, the break is released and the fish enter puberty. It also means that all the significant differences, if there were, between VGL3 genotypes, they must happen in the immature state. Right? So that's when the gene is being active. If it's not being active, there's no genotypic association that can be, can be, uh, can be made. So this really pointed that the immature testes is the, is the, um, uh, the tissue that, that we should be con concentrating on. Now, testing for expression differences between VGL3 genotypes did not, did not show anything per se. What we saw, very interestingly, was that the VGL3 genotypes tended to express different isoforms of the gene, so different transcript structures between the, uh, the genotypes where in addition to these protein coding changes that we knew of um, from the association study, we could see that the early uh, uh, genotype tended to express this long canonical isoform of VGL3, whereas the late 
uh, genotypes tended to express more of this short novel isoformat that, that we didn't know that existed before uh, we started our studies. Okay, so we saw this uh, isoform expression difference between BGL3 uh, itself. So this uh, indicates that there might be something very dr dramatic in the function of BGL3 protein. How does it regulate the other genes of the, of the genome? And to test this, uh, we profiled a gene expression and, and chromatin activity along the second year of development from the same uh, cohort of the fish. Uh, so one year later. We sampled individuals across the first, uh, the second year uh, of development from early spring into autumn and uh, sequenced their testes transcriptomes using, using RNA-seq. Uh, and on the PCA there, you can see that the major source of variation in testicular expression was that seasonal variation. So we found uh, around a thousand differentially expressed genes uh, that associated with seasonal variation. However, we also found 70 genes that were differentially expressed between the VGL3 genotypes. And I've uh, highlighted uh, five there that I'm going to come back to. We also found genes that showed uh, association with both season and VGL3 uh, genotype here, NR5A1, which is a transcription factor that is a major controller of sexual maturation uh, in Atlantic salmon and many other vertebrates. Uh, as well. And then we found uh, 35 genes with an interaction uh, between seasonal variation and VGL3 genotype. Here, the example is uh, NCOA1, which is another transcriptional regulator that controls the uh, balance between lipid acquisition versus lipid utilization. Okay, so very interesting genes coming up uh, differentially expressed between VGL3 genotypes, but is that differential expression mediated by VGL3 itself? And to answer this question, uh, we looked at where does VGL3 bind uh, the DNA in, in the genome of the, of the Atlantic salmon? And we did uh, what is called ChIP-seq, so chromatin immunoprofile immunoprecipitation sequencing. Um, I just have a short slide here if uh, you're not familiar with the technique so that you can follow the rest of the presentation. So here, in this technique, the question is, where is my regulatory protein present in the DNA in the, uh, in the genome? What you do is you fix those protein DNA interactions. You fragment that DNA, typically using ultrasound, and then you use an antibody specific to your regulatory protein to fish out the bits of chromatin that contain your uh, regulatory protein now fixed to the DNA. Uh, you make a sequencing library out of it, you sequence and you map back to the genome. And this gives you a sequencing depth uh, uh, and the peaks uh, indicates where did that um, uh, regulatory protein was present in your genome, right? Um, and I'm gonna show you um, an example of what it looks like for VGL3. Um, I'll start with this simple um, example here. The gene is CYP17A1, uh, a rate-limiting enzyme in the production of, of uh, sexual of androgens, so male sexual hormones, higher expression in the EEs versus the LLs. And when we look at where is it regulated by VGL3 protein itself, we see a very significant uh, uh, peak uh, of VGL3 chip seq signal in the five prime region of this gene. So that's the green trace right there down, down below. So this indicates that this differential expression between the, the genotypes was very likely mediated by binding of VGL3 itself. So direct regulation by VGL3. And this sort of pattern was indeed very common in our data set. So of the 70 differential expressed genes, 63% had these VGL3 binding sites in their proximity, um, a media, uh, meaning that that expression difference was likely mediated by VGL3 uh, in cis. Of these, 81% um, were expressed higher in the EE uh, genotype, meaning that there's probably something in the EE isoform of VGL3 that leads to an upregulation of all these genes. Now, I gave an example of CYP17A1, but our, our differentially expressed genes were indeed uh, represented very different functions or very different uh, phenotypes, cellular phenotypes of the of, uh, of the testes. So um, the, sim the similar pattern was, was seen for NR5A1, so the sexual maturation transcription factor, uh, CYP17A1, malic enzyme 3, that 
functions in the TCA cycle, so production of cellular energy. Uh, LTBB4, that regulates the activity of TGF beta signaling. Semaphorin 3D, that regulates uh, cell motility. And NCOA1, that controls its lipid acquisition versus utilization uh, phenotypes. So the point here is that BGL3 is uh, regulating, co-regulating all these different genes in a concerted manner that represent very different uh, cellular phenotypes. So it's like a single signal of BGL3 produces a concerted change in all these phenotypes uh, uh, downstream. Okay, so I had talked about how VGL3 regulates individual genes. Now we can ask the question, does VGL3 regulate groups of genes? Um, and uh, to address this question, we uh, did what's called a uh, gene co-expression network analysis. Here you take expression values of your individual genes that are the nodes here, and you build co-expression modules. So now you have groups of genes that tend to be upregulated or downregulated or share the same expression dynamics across your samples. And then you test the expression of that module, so that group of gene uh, in between your VGL3 genotypes or your, or your season. And when we do this analysis, we find five uh, modules uh, containing hundreds of thousands of genes uh, associated with VGL3 genotype. Here I'm showing, I'm sorry, it doesn't reproduce very well, the points, individual points there. Um, this module containing around 1,000 gene, higher expression in the EE. Um, then we find four modules uh, with uh, an association with um, season. So here, a, a module containing 3,500 genes uh, overrepresented in cell-cell adhesion, cell migration, and wind, um, and showing a downward trend towards later in the season. What's really interesting about this module is that it contained VGL3 itself. So this allows us to uh, dig even deeper into, into the dynamics of how does VGL3 uh, co-regulate these genes. So another representation of the same module, so these are all the 3,500 genes, and the closer they are to the center of that module, the higher their co-expression is. Uh, the uh, yellow dot right there is VGL3 itself, and the orange dots are the, are the genes most closely co-regulated with VGL3. So you can see that VGL3 uh, situates in, in, in towards the center of the, of the module. So it was co-regulated with lots of genes. Uh, and most of the, the network was indeed very highly uh, connected to VGL3. Now we can ask the question, go back to our ChIP-seq data and ask the same question we did for the individual genes. Is this expression dynamics uh, me mediated by VGL3 binding on DNA close to these genes. And when we look at the proportion of these closest network neighbors uh, and how many of those have VGL3 binding peaks versus a random expectation, we see a very strong overrepresentation, meaning that a lot of this expression dynamics in these 3,500 genes were indeed mediated by VGL3 binding in cis. Okay. Um, so I told you that VGL3 interacts or regulates other genes in association with transcription factors. So VGL3 itself doesn't contain a DNA binding domain. It always needs transcription factors to mediate its function. Now, what, knowing what those transcription factors uh, are might give us novel uh, or might give us more information of, of what are the cellular processes that VGL3 um, regulates. A way to address this question is to look at sequence overrepresentation in VGL3 binding peak. So each transcription factor will have its own uh, binding motif. So a sequence of ATGC, uh, typically four to six base pair that it scans the genome and where it finds that motif, it binds and it completes its regulatory role. So now we can look at sequence rep overrepresentation of these motifs in VGL3 binding peaks. And we did this for uh, separately for the EE peaks and for the LL peaks, so early and late. And interestingly, we find quite different uh, motif overrepresentations in VGL3 binding peaks. So a, a, a little bit of a complicated uh, figure, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So here you have the overrepresentation rank of transcription factor binding motifs in the LL and in the EE genotypes. So each individual point is a motif like shown there for SF1. On the diagonal, uh, you have motifs that are 
uh, not differentially overrepresented between the genotypes. Down below here on the on the bottom right corner, you have motifs that are overrepresented in both. So these were the, the most, they correspond to the transcription factors that BGL3 was present most often. And then off to the off from the diagonal, you have motifs that are differentially overrepresented in the EE versus the LL. Below the diagonal, you see, for example, SF1 and Wom's tumor 1. So these uh, sexual maturation regulators that were highly over, more overrepresented in the EE genotype versus the LL. And above the diagonal, you have these regulators of cell cycle and cell motility and transcriptional repression that were overrepresented in the LL uh, genotypes versus the EE. So what we see is that VGL3 genotypes seem to be, or VGL3 protein in different genotypes seem to be interacting with very distinct sets of transcription factors, those that promote sexual maturity in the EE genotype and those that promote kind of this stagnation of the cell cycle and inhibition of, of uh, maturation changes in the LL genotype. Now, are all of these patterns causal or correlational? So are all of these transcriptional changes and, and uh, uh, chromatin changes just something that happens at the same time uh, or differentially between the, the genotypes or are they mediated by really causa causational links through VGL3? And this is a very difficult question to answer in, the, in an organism like uh, Atlantic salmon. So you can produce uh, uh, crispants, for example, but it takes multiple years for them to uh, become sexually mature. So actually screening for whatever function that you're interested in uh, is very, is very time consuming. Um, Jackie, who was a previous postdoc in, in uh, Craig's group, came up with this very ingenious way of, of uh, testing this. And it all uh, stems down to this higher expression in the immature state versus the late uh, versus the mature state uh, of uh, so higher VGL3 expression in immature testes. So this indicates that if we block VGL3 function in the immature state, it should lead to uh, cell type or, or pubital like changes in the testes um, uh, uh, tissue. So what what Jackie did is she took individual uh, or, or testes from individual fish and then uh, col uh, cultured them in, in tissue culture in controlled conditions with the BSA or with our anti-VGL3 antibody. So knocking down VGL3 function, interfering with its function. Uh, and what you're looking at are tissue sections of immature gonads. Uh, the control, so the BSA control there looks completely normal. But what you see in the anti-VGL3 uh, treatment is that you have this uh, higher density of, uh, of cells uh, meaning that uh, they had initiated cell proliferation, and you have this very abnormal uh, pointy-like morphology, uh, meaning that the, um, or indicating that the motility of the cells had been increased. So these types of changes that, similar changes that occur during puberty, and also that we predicted based on our uh, transcriptional uh, data. So indeed, VGL3 seems to be causational in mediating these cell type changes in the testes. Now, currently I'm uh, using a uh, single nuclei multi-omics to dig in deeper into these, what are uh, the actual cell types where VGL3 is performing its function and how. And uh, the whole idea of this is that you have a chunk of tissue and instead of doing your uh, uh, RNA-seq or, or uh, chip-seq on individual or, or on the on the tissue level, that is a mix of different cell types. You separate each individual nuclei and you do your analysis on the single nuclei level, uh, leading, to, uh, leading to this very, uh, very multi-dimensional multi-omic analysis. Now, uh, a way of representing this data is uh, shown here, which is a UMAP of uh, single nuclear RNA-seq, so single nuclear gene expression. You can think of it as a, as a very complex PCA where uh, each individual point is an individual nuclei and they're grouping uh, based on their transcriptional profiles. And now looking at gene expression in those groups, you can sort out what cells the nuclei came from. So for example, here you have spermatogonia in different uh, phases of uh, development. And down here you have the Sertoli cells, which are the mitotic cell type of the testes. 
Now, how this can be used uh, to understand VGL3 function, I'm coming back to in, uh, in, in one slide, but to, uh, in order to make that point, I'm bringing, back, bringing you back into this original GWAS figure where we saw uh, the uh, higher association of uh, VGL3 genotype in the, in the region adjacent to VGL3 itself meaning that there are probably some regulatory re, uh, sequences in that or regulatory elements in that intergenic region that contribute to this mechanism of VGL3 uh, association with age maturity. And there on the left, you see our VGL3 chip seek signal. And you can see this very dramatic uh, uh, signal of VGL3 binding in that exact same region, intergenic downstream of VGL3. So indicating that probably VGL3 self-regulation is part of the uh, mechanism of genotype to phenotype association. Now we can dig into this deeper using our multi-omic uh, data uh, and look at uh, in which cells is VGL3 itself being active. And I hope you can see uh, the, uh, the orange to red dots are the, are the nuclei where VGL3 itself was being active. So mainly spermatogonia. And then we can ask the question, well, where is this uh, VGL3 binding peak active? And it's not the same cells. It's not overlapping with VGL3 uh, activity itself, but situates are, are is it attributed into these uh, Sertoli cells. So this really indicates that um, this peak is regulating uh, VGL3 expression in different cell types and mediating that sort of dynamics of where and when is VGL3 being expressed. Um, okay, so that was a lot of genomics. Uh, I'm bringing you back now to uh, the bigger picture. Um, so trying to figure out um, uh, how does the genotype to phenotype map in VGL3 uh, really uh, happen. So uh, it seems to start with causal mutations, uh, uh, alternative splicing and uh, protein coding changes in VGL3 that interact with uh, different transcription factors or change the interaction of VGL3 with dif different transcription factors that then drive different cellular processes where uh, androgen production, cell motility, uh, TGF theta signaling and lipid metabolism were all upregulated concertedly in the carriers of the ear early genotype. And we believe that this leads to a kind of uh, priming uh, of maturation so that the carriers of the E allele are more likely to um, uh, initiate pubertal changes earlier in life. What's interesting about this uh, as well is that we can uh, tie these different cellular processes in into the other phenotypes associated with VGL3 genotype like uh, aerobic performance, body condition, and aggressive behavior. So uh, this molecular or genotype to phenotype map really allows us to understand, well, how does VGL3 control all these different uh, phenotypes? So how does this then uh, tie into the bigger picture of, of the genetic or functional architecture of adaptive traits uh, in life histories? Um, so you can think of uh, the architecture as connections between the genotype here on the top row and the phenotype uh, in, the, in, the low, uh, in the row below, and that architecture having different configurations depending uh, on the traits. So in the simplest case, the genetic architecture might be very simple, where you have one single gene controlling one phenotype. And when we're talking about adaptive traits, uh, this is very uh, commonly seen, for example, in coloration. Here, an example from beach mice, where um, uh, mutations typically in agouti or, or MC1R leads uh, to changes in, in pigmentation by uh, uh, controlling whether or not melanocytes produce melanin or not. So a very simple uh, genetic uh, architecture of this adaptive trait. On the other hand of the spectrum, you might have something like human height, not adaptive, uh, but still, which is very, very complex. And here the current kind of model of how does this, what is the mechanism of this uh, complex genetic architecture uh, is called, what, uh, or this is kind of the, the, the more um, uh, common way of thinking about it this way, uh, called the omnigenic model, where Basically, all the genes in your genome might contribute to variation in complex traits through very complex interactions through regulatory uh, networks. So a very, very extremely complex 
functional architecture of, of these traits. Now, what we see in, in uh, age of maturity is something in between, and we decided to call it subcomplex because it's uh, like a subunit of that complex genetic architecture where you have a single gene controlling uh, phenotypic variation in multiple different phenotypes. Um, and we believe that this, uh, this functional architecture might uh, allow us to explain some of the unknown questions about life history uh, variation and life history trade-offs. For example, are these trade-offs in life histories uh, uh, resource-based or mechanistic? Well, if two different traits that are uh, being traded off uh, are controlled by the same gene, this is a mechanistic uh, um, mechanism or, or, or a molecular mechanism of trade-off. Um, there's lots of pleiotropy typically seen in uh, life history traits. And if multiple different uh, phenotypes are controlled by the same gene, this uh, uh, explains a mechanism for pleiotropy. Um, and also you see in some cases that life histories can evolve very dramatically. So these complex, phenotypically complex uh, 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 kind of syndromes can change uh, frequencies in, within population very fast. And how does that happen if all of these different traits are controlled by different genes is, uh, it might be very hard, but if all of these traits are controlled by the same gene, uh, you might change the allele frequency in a single gene causing variation in all these different phenotypes or evolution in all these different phenotypes. And this is uh, exactly the sort of dynamics that we see in age and maturity uh, in Atlantic salmon. So here I have an example from a, from a study a couple of years back where they looked at the age structure of returning salmon uh, in a, um, uh, from the 1940s to up to, to 2020s. And the uh, yellow line there is the water flow in the river. So the river is being dammed after the war in 1950s. And what you see is that before the river was dammed, water flow was very high. And the salmon population was dominated by these really big multi-sea winter fish. After the damming, the water flow goes down and the population very dramatically within 20 years changes completely to being dominated by these very young, small salmon. They then looked at uh, uh, the, the genomics or the, uh, the, the genetics of these changes of these populations. And what they saw was that the highest allele frequency changes corresponded to BGL3. Uh, and 66, another regulator of agent maturity that we knew from the association study. So really, uh, changes in a single gene, BGL3, uh, can lead to these very fast and dramatic changes in life histories uh, within uh, a couple of, of decades. Okay, so uh, that was a lot about BGL3. So I'm going to change topics, uh, change gears a little bit here. Uh, for something completely different and bring you back home to Canada. Uh, we are here in, in the island of Newfoundland. This is drone footage by my um, collaborator, Dylan Fraser at, the, at Concordia University. And we are, what you are seeing uh, are these small streams flowing from a barren uh, landscape. Uh, these are very species poor, uh, uh, ecosystems containing basically three to four um, species, Atlantic salmon, uh, trout, uh, brook trout, uh, stickleback, and an occasional eel. Uh, and what's really interesting about these um, uh, ecosystems is that they host the smallest known Atlantic salmon in the world. So what you're looking at here in the, in the map is the range of landlocked Atlantic salmon. So not all Atlantic salmon migrate out to sea, but you have these populations, entire populations that are, that are completing their life cycle within fresh waters. Um, the, uh, the photo there is from our study location in Cape Race. And what's interesting, like I, like I said, is that these host a minute uh, salmon. So uh, you typically tend to think of a salmon as a big, you know, a meter fish. Well, these are 10 centimeter long when they become uh, sexually mature and they live in this ditch that you can basically jump over. It's really uh, fascinating how these uh, salmon can adapt to different, um, different ecosystems. Now, um, 
So they become sexually mature at an extremely young age and an extremely small size, but that, that's not the only very fascinating uh, thing about these minute salmon. Uh, and the other um, kind of very interesting phenotype that they show uh, um, connects back to allometry. So allometry is a very um, a classical topic in evolutionary biology. It means the change in proportions of bodies uh, of body parts or organs as your body size changes. So here in this example, you have uh, the relationship between palm size and body size in this uh, crab. And instead of being a one-to-one, -one, uh, an isometric um, relationship, the bigger the crab is, even proportionally bigger the palm is. So this is an allometric change uh, as, as the body size, the body size of the crab changes. Um, allometry changes uh, are not only seen within uh, a species, but they are a very significant source of evolutionary novelty. Uh, the most uh, uh, classical example uh, is Darwin's finches, where you have an, a single uh, founding population or, or species with a mediocre uh, or this kind of small, medium-sized beak, uh, giving uh, birth to a flock of, of species of different uh, finches that each species change the proportion of their beaks to uh, match their, the food that they are eating. So allometry can be a very significant source of evolutionary novelty. Now we see uh, a very interesting allometric uh, relationship uh, within salmon when we compare the anadromous salmon to these mi minuscule dwarf salmon. So what you're seeing here is the uh, relative size of the ovary uh, to the body uh, in dwarf salmon as in the blue and in anadromous salmon. So these sea migrating salmon in the, in the um, white. So if you think of a big salmon getting trapped in a ditch, so if the body size starts to shrink, normally everything should shrink down. So uh, normally you would think that this minuscule uh, fish would produce thousands of eggs like a big salmon does, but they would be very small. The problem with that is that those small eggs won't be viable. So instead they have opted to produce few eggs. So they have very small fecundities from 10 to 30, uh, but the eggs are big, right? So as to guarantee that the offspring have uh, good uh, chances of surviving. And this trade-off between the egg number and egg size in these um, dwarfs has led to this allometric uh, change in the proportion of their ovaries where, where they start off with ovaries that are half the size of the ovaries of the anadromous salmon. Then they grow uh, very fast to a bigger size because the, the, uh, when, they, when they mature. Um, so we are very interested in, or I am rather very interested in understanding, well, what is the molecular mechanism that controls this allometric change in ovary proportion and therefore fecundity? So this trade-off between egg number and size. And to do this, uh, we went last fall to Cape Race with uh, Dylan right here in the photo uh, and collected gametes from these very unique fish. Um, so all of the fish that you see in the photos are sexually mature, uh, around 10 centimeters uh, in length. So very, very fascinating uh, type of fish. Um, I'm giving you an example of what it looks like there, uh, a prime dwarf salmon habitat. Uh, is a ditch, like I said, maybe uh, ankle deep. This is, um, this is Cameron from Memorial University that came to help us um, with collecting the gametes from these fish. So you, this is a fish that you can basically just electrofish and uh, keep in a bucket and then strip the eggs and bring the, bring the eggs back, down, back to, uh, to your lab where you grow them out. And to, uh, as a contrast, of course, we need, we need something to control. Uh, and we went to a DFO hatchery in Nova Scotia to collect gametes from multi-sea winter big fish. Here uh, you're seeing the, the collection of gametes from this uh, multi-sea winter uh, female salmon that is relatively small, just for the record. And if you've never seen how uh, salmon are being spawned, you will witness it very uh, soon. So the salmon is being anesthetized and then you just basically squeeze thousands and thousands of eggs from that poor female. Um, and I go in and I scoop out a hundred eggs and bring them back to the lab and uh, do the fertilizations in the lab. 
And now we have uh, about 100, 150 uh, families, half the families of these dwarfs uh, of anadromous salmon. And then uh, because we did this back to back, we could produce hybrids, so F1 hybrids between the anadromous and the dwarf salmon. Now, uh, the idea here in this project is going uh, from the genotypic level all the way up to the phenotypic, to the fitness level uh, in these alternative life histories. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, ovary transcriptomes between the dwarfs uh, and the anadromous and seeing what is the regulatory divergence between the two, uh, what are the molecular mechanisms that control for this allometric difference. Uh, and luckily, we have the F1 hybrid, so this allows us to test for allospecificity of these mechanisms, really to test what is specific to the uh, dwarf genome versus the uh, anadromous genome that, that mediates these differences. Then the uh, idea is to test uh, these candidate genes in cell models using CRISPR-Cas9, so as to uh, figure out whether or not these genes really control for these proliferation cell size, these cellular differences that we think are involved in this, in this phenotype. And because we have half sick families, we can look at the evolvability of these uh, uh, fitness traits. So for example, does the allometry uh, share genetic covariation with fitness? So very um, powerful quantitative genetics um, framework. Okay, but that's all uh, work to be done. At this point, I'd like to thank my, uh, or acknowledge my my co-authors, so uh, my previous postdoc lab, Craig Primer, uh, and everyone uh, in that big group, uh, my Marie Curie um, uh, team, Dylan Fraser, Alisa Pickney, and Fred Guillaume, um, all the funders. And just uh, to end, I'd like to uh, just uh, give a small ad. So I will be starting a, a faculty position as associate professor in genomics at Nord University in Buda. So that's a very quaint 50,000 uh, people town uh, right above the no Arctic Circle in, in Northern Norway. It also happens to be the 2024 European capital of culture, which allows me to show you these wonderful promotional videos of, of Buda. Um, I will be uh, soon advertising for a PhD position that is uh, starting in 2025. It's uh, it's a three years position, um, and if you're con if if um, people are concerned about the high standard or, or high cost of living in Norway, the the salary is according to that. Um, and uh, maybe I would like like to ask you if you hear someone uh, interested in in studying salmon uh, and allometries and and life histories, send them my way. I'd be very very um, very, very grateful. So with that, I'd like to thank your, um, your interest and I'm happy to take any questions.